ever feel like um, you're searching for a little more inner peace in this crazy world? Yeah, tell me about it. Well, you're in luck, because today's deep dive takes us straight to the source, Marcus Aurelius. Oh, yeah. I love Marcus Aurelius. You're a Roman emperor who found serenity in the midst of chaos. In the midst of chaos, yeah. We're digging into excerpts from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, his own meditations, and more to see what wisdom we can unearth. Yeah, and what's remarkable is that, you know, we're not talking about some detached philosopher up in an ivory tower. Right. Imagine, like, facing down rebellions, battling Germanic tribes, even navigating a devastating plague, all while pondering the meaning of life. Yeah. Talk about high-pressure situations. It's mind-boggling, right? It's like trying to meditate during a hurricane. Yeah. Which makes his commitment to Stoicism all the more intriguing. I yeah. mean, this wasn't just a casual interest for Aurelius. Right. It was his operating system for life. Precisely. And those meditations were exploring. They weren't like some grand philosophical treatise. They were his personal journal scribbled down on campaign, probably by candlelight, after a day of making impossible decisions. So we're getting a glimpse into his raw, unfiltered thoughts. Exactly. No wonder they feel so relatable, even centuries later. Absolutely. He's grappling with very human struggles, duty loss, even frustration. Yeah. In one passage, he talks about dealing with a difficult person in his life. Someone who sounds a lot like a political rival, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a reminder that even emperors had their share of drama. It makes you realize, even back then, they were dealing with office politics. Yeah. Okay, so let's back up a bit. For those not familiar, who exactly was Marcus Aurelius? Well, he was Emperor of Rome from 161 to 180 CE, a period historians call the Pax Romana, okay. a time of relative peace and prosperity. But don't let that fool you. His reign was also marked by incredible challenges and constant threats to the empire. So Stoicism wasn't just an intellectual exercise, it was a necessity. A way to cope with the weight of the world, literally. Exactly. He even talks about how stoicism helped him deal with anger and frustration. Mm. This wasn't some abstract philosophy. It was his toolkit for navigating the very real pressures of leadership. And a key part of that toolkit was the influence of another stoic, Epictetus. Ah, uh, yes, Epictetus. I've heard he was a former slave who became a philosopher, mm -hmm. which is a whole other story. What was it about Epictetus' teachings that resonated so strongly with Marcus Aurelius? It was Epictetus' emphasis on what we can actually control our minds, our judgments, our reactions to whatever life throws our way. Right. He outlined these three areas of training, managing desires, controlling impulses, and mastering our judgments. Okay, break that down for me. Yeah. What does that look like in practice? Imagine you get a flat tire on your way to work. Ugh, the worst. That's frustrating, right? Wait. But we can't control the flat tire. What we can control is our reaction. Right. Do we get angry, upset, and let it ruin our day? Oh, yeah. Or do we take a deep breath, accept the situation, and focus on what, what we can do about it? That makes sense. It's about choosing our response instead of letting our emotions run wild. Precisely. And that's where those Greek terms you mentioned come in Fantasia Horum and Orexus. Okay. They represent those initial impressions, impulses, and desires that can lead us astray. Okay, let's unpack those a bit. Fantasia, those mental snapshots as you call them, I get those all the time. Yeah. Someone cuts me off in traffic, boom. Instant mental snapshot of annoyance. Exactly. And Aurelius following Epictetus would say we have a choice. Right. We can let that fantasia, that initial impression, take root and dictate our emotions. Root rate. Right. Precisely. Or we can choose to examine it. Is this mental snapshot accurate? Is this reaction helpful? Can I choose a different thought, a more productive response? So it's about recognizing that we have those mental snapshots, yes. but we don't have to be ruled by them. We have the power to hit the delete button. Exactly. And that's where Horme comes in that impulse to act on those initial impressions. Okay. Aurelius believed we could train ourselves to pause to examine those impulses before blindly following them. It's like hitting the pause button before hitting the reply button on a heated email, right? I like that analogy. Yeah. And finally, we have orexis, which encompasses our desires and aversions. Stoicism doesn't say we can't have desires, right. but it encourages us to examine them to understand their root and to detach ourselves from unhealthy attachments. So it's about understanding that while we might not always get what we want, we can choose how we let that affect us. Yes. It's about finding freedom and acceptance. 
I'm seeing how this ties into the meditations being more than just a diary. Yes. It was his training ground for putting these ideas into practice. Absolutely. Remember that quote we discussed, wipe out impression, mm -hmm. fantasia, check yeah. impulse, or may, and quench desire, or rexus. Yes. That wasn't just a nice sounding phrase for Aurelius, it was an active exercise he used to train his mind. He was basically creating his own mental fitness routine. Yes. And speaking of mental fitness, that brings us to another fascinating aspect of the meditations, the cosmic viewpoint. What's that all about? And this is where things get really interesting. But this is where things get really interesting. Give me the cosmic viewpoint. Okay, picture this. You're Marcus Aurelius facing down barbarian hordes at the edge of the empire. Life is short, brutal, and your to-do list includes things like prevent the collapse of civilization. Yeah, no pressure or anything. Exactly. And yet, in the midst of all this, Aurelius takes the time to contemplate the vastness of the universe. He writes about the infinite expanse of time, how our lives are but fleeting moments in the grand scheme of things. It's kind of like that pale blue dot photo of Earth taken from billions of miles away. Oh. Suddenly, all our earthly concerns seem so insignificant. Precisely. And that's what's so powerful about this cosmic perspective. When we zoom out, when we contemplate the sheer scale of the universe and the endless flow of time, our everyday worries can start to feel less overwhelming. Okay, I can see how that would be helpful for an emperor facing down existential threats. But what about us regular folks? How does the cosmic viewpoint apply to, say, my stress about a work deadline? That's a great question, and it gets to the heart of why Aurelius' writings are so enduring. This isn't just about emperors and empires, it's about the human condition. So how do I apply this cosmic thinking to my deadline freakout? Think about it this way. Aurelius would probably say, Will this deadline matter in 10 years? In 100 years? In 10,000 years? Chances are it won't even be a blip on the radar of cosmic time. I can see how that would shift my perspective. Mm. It's not that the deadline isn't real, it's that I'm choosing to view it within a larger context. Exactly, and that shift in perspective can be incredibly freeing because when we recognize that we are a small part of something much grander, our problems often begin to shrink in comparison. It's like that feeling you get when you look up at a star-filled night sky. It puts things in perspective. Right? right. You realize how vast the universe is and how short and precious our time is here. Yeah. It makes you want to savor the good moments and not sweat the small stuff quite so much. Absolutely. And that segues perfectly into another key takeaway from the meditations, the power of judgment. Okay, so how does the cosmic viewpoint tie into the idea that we have control over our judgments? Because when we adopt that wider lens, when we remember how fleeting our time is and how much exists beyond our immediate concerns, it becomes easier to detach from unhelpful judgments. We create a healthy distance between ourselves and our thoughts. So instead of getting caught up in the drama of a frustrating email or a traffic jam, we can tap into that cosmic awareness and choose a more balanced response. You've got it. It's not about denying reality or pretending that challenges don't exist. It's about recognizing that our suffering often stems from our judgments about those challenges, judgments we have the power to examine and reframe. Which is a very empowering idea. We're not just passive passengers along for the ride. We have agency even when it doesn't feel like it. It reminds me of a quote from the meditations. The happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Did I get that right? You absolutely did. Aurelius believed we become what we repeatedly think about, and that's why he placed such emphasis on cultivating self-awareness and choosing our thoughts carefully. That's a powerful message. It's just that true change, true peace of mind begins within. Precisely. And it echoes what we were discussing earlier about those mental snapshots, those fantasias. We can't always control what pops into our minds, but we can choose whether to give those thoughts power over us. It's like we have this inner control panel and we can choose to turn down the volume on negativity and amplify the thoughts that bring us peace, clarity, and a sense of purpose. It's almost like mental decluttering, right? We get rid of the thoughts that no longer serve us, that don't spark joy to borrow from Marie Kondo. That's a fantastic analogy. Just as we declutter our homes to create a more peaceful environment, we can declutter our minds to cultivate inner peace. So how do we actually do that? How do we go from reading about Stoicism to embodying it in our daily lives? Well, for Mark Aurelius, it was a daily practice. He didn't just read about Stoicism, he lived it. Yeah. He turned those principles into daily rituals, writing about them, reflecting on them, using them to navigate the very real challenges of his life. He was constantly putting these ideas to the test, even while running an empire. It makes you realize that we all have the capacity for this kind of inner work, no matter how busy or chaotic our lives might seem. Absolutely. Remember, he faced incredible pressures and uncertainties. Yet amidst all that, he found solace and strength in Stoic philosophy. 
If he could do it, imagine what we can accomplish with a little dedication. So it's less about achieving some unattainable state of perfect serenity and more about building mental resilience, about learning to navigate the inevitable ups and downs of life with greater grace and wisdom. You've hit the nail on the head, and that's what makes Aurelius's work so relevant to us today. He wasn't writing for some elite group of philosophers. He was writing to himself, grappling with very human emotions, trying to find a better way to live in a world that often felt chaotic and unpredictable. It's like having a conversation with a wise friend, someone who's been there, done that, and emerged with hard-won insights. Exactly. And the best part is we can revisit that conversation anytime we need guidance. His meditations are a gift, a source of timeless wisdom that we can draw on again and again throughout our lives. So where do we go from here? How do we take this ancient wisdom and make it relevant to our modern lives? How do we bridge that gap between theory and practice? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And I think it's something we all have to figure out for ourselves. But that's the exciting part, isn't it? It's like we've been handed this treasure map of wisdom. Yeah. And now it's up to us to chart our own course. I love that analogy. And just like any good treasure hunt, it's not about simply reading the map. It's about putting one foot in front of the other, experimenting and discovering what works for us. So where do we even begin? I mean, Marcus Aurelius was an emperor. He had people to handle his schedule and probably like a personal chef who specialized in stoic snacks. Right. How do we possibly integrate these practices into our already jam-packed lives? Well, it doesn't require a palace revolution or anything. Yeah. Remember how we talked about Aurelius using his meditations as a kind of mental training round? Yeah. We can do the same thing. You mean like journaling? Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> uh -huh. Because my handwriting is terrible and I tend to doodle hearts in the margins. No judgment here. It doesn't have to be a chore. The point is to find ways to bring these ideas into our daily awareness. Maybe it's taking five minutes each morning to reflect on a passage from the meditations. Okay. Maybe it's using those stoic principles we talked about, managing desires, controlling impulses, mastering judgments as a framework for navigating challenging situations. So like next time I'm about to lose it over a delayed flight. Yeah. I can channel my inner Marcus Aurelius and say, okay, this is beyond my control. What can I do right now to make the best of this situation? Exactly. Or let's say you're dealing with a difficult coworker. Oh yeah. Instead of getting caught up in anger or frustration, you can ask yourself, is this reaction helpful? How would Marcus Aurelius approach the situation? It's almost like having a personal philosopher on speed dial someone to give you that calm, rational perspective mm -hmm. when your own mind is racing. And the more we engage with these ideas, the more they become ingrained in our thinking. It's like building a muscle. The more we exercise it, the stronger it gets. So it's not about becoming a stoic sage overnight. It's mm -hmm. about taking small, consistent steps, experimenting, and seeing what resonates with us. Precisely. Remember, even Marcus Aurelius was a work in progress. Oh, really? He constantly questioned himself, challenged his own assumptions, and strived to live in alignment with his values. It's reassuring to know that even an emperor who seemed to have it all figured out was still on his own journey of growth. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of this philosophy. It's not about achieving some distant ideal of perfection. It's about showing up every day and trying to be a little bit better, a little wiser, a little more at peace with ourselves and the world around us. So as we wrap up our deep dive into the world of Marcus Aurelius and the enduring wisdom of Stoicism, what's the one takeaway you hope our listeners will carry with them? That's easy. Don't just read Aurelius, engage with him. Challenge his ideas, reflect on their relevance to your own life. And most importantly, experiment with putting those stoic principles into practice. You might be surprised by the wisdom and peace you uncover within yourself. It's a reminder that true strength comes not from external power or possessions, but from within, from cultivating a mind that is resilient, adaptable, and at peace. Beautifully said. And on that note, I think we've reached a natural point to wrap up. It's been an absolute pleasure diving deep into these ideas with you. Till next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and remember there's a little bit of Marcus Aurelius in all of us. We hold our heads high through the stormy skies, we never say die. Facing every challenge on a stoic night, with every step forward, we ignite the night. Bounce back from the falls, never showing no fear. In the darkest moments, our minds stay clear with a heart of iron and a steady aim. We charge through the pain, never seeking fame. Keep it moving, keep it strong. Push it forward all day long Stoic courage, battle on Raise your voice and sing this song 
valleys low to the highest peaks We conquer the silence even when it speaks Life's battles rage on, we never shy away Standing firm in the fray each and every day Rhythm of resilience pounding in our chest Fighting every battle, never taking rest Stoic courage flowing in our veins Through the joy and through the pains Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Song. Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Stoic courage, battle on Raise your voice and sing Low to the highest peaks We conquer the silence even when it speaks Life's battles rage on We never shy away Standing firm in the fray each and every day Rhythm of resilience pounding in our chest Fighting every battle never taking rest Stoic courage flowing in our veins Through the joy and through the pains Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Stoic courage battle not to quit until they find it. When our children are learning how to walk, how many times will your baby attempt to walk and fall and you just say, just sit down, don't try anymore, you've fallen 20 times. <laughs> just sit down somewhere, busting your lip and everything, getting in folks' way. When will a baby walk? It will walk when it walks. That's when it will walk. Les, when will you be known nationally as the motivator? I will be known when I'm known. That's when I'll be known. <laughs> Don't get caught up in, well, I've tried it four or five times and things didn't work out. If there's something that you want and you're hungry for it, you've got to do whatever is necessary until. And when you give the best you can and that's not enough, you must do what is required. And don't give up on yourself. Don't throw the towel in so quickly. Many people give up on the one yard line where if they had the determination just to keep on knocking. It's a funny thing about life. If you're home one day and someone is knocking on the door and you say, I don't want to be bothered today. And if that person just keep on knocking, can you believe that fool's still knocking? <laughs> Pretty soon you say, what is it? What do you want? And that's how you've got to be about your dream. Respect is earned. Honesty is appreciated. Trust is gained. Loyalty is returned. If you need music on the beach, you're missing the point. The one who is unaffected by pleasure and pain, who is steady in success and failure, and who remains undisturbed by the changing conditions of life is a true yogi. Bhagavad Gita In the end, everything will be okay. If it's not okay, it's not yet the end. The master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. The only real limitation on your abilities is the level of your desires. If you want it badly enough, there are no limits on what you can achieve. Brian Tracy Long-range impact on our children as far as self-image is concerned, occurs in the preteen or very early teenage years. When the child who has this poor self-image, who does not have a lot of friends, who one day realizes that Johnny and Mary are different, that boys and girls are different, Johnny meets Mary 
And Johnny has been rejected in his mind all of his life. Mary's been rejected all of her life in her eyes. And now they discover each other. And they discover that chemistry is in more places than in the laboratory. And they kind of latch on to each other. For the first time, they find somebody who loves them just for themselves. And a very volatile situation is underway. That's one of the reasons the study done by Concerned Women for America shows something that is rather intriguing. Here's what they discovered. Girls who start dating at 12, the odds are five to one, that by the time they graduate from high school, they will be in a sexual relationship. Girls who start dating at age 16, the odds are five to one that they will not be involved in a sexual relationship by the time they finish high school. Very significant. The parents' self-image, therefore, will play a major role in the way they deal with their child. Because how many times does a child come home with incredible pressure and want to start dating? All of her classmates are going out. I so well remember when our oldest daughter started putting the pressure on us. Remember that on the one hand, desires command you to obtain what you long for. And on the other, aversions command you to avoid what you dislike. Those who fail to gain what they desire are unfortunate, whilst those who fall into what they seek to avoid are miserable. So if you seek to avoid only those things contrary to nature, amongst the things that are in your power, you will accordingly fall into nothing to which you are averse. But if you seek to avoid sickness or death or poverty, you will be miserable. Two. Therefore, remove altogether your aversion for anything that is not in our power and transfer it to those things contrary to nature that are in our power. For the time being, completely restrain your desires. For if you desire any of those things not in our power, you are bound to suffer misfortune. For of those things in our power, which it would be proper to desire, none is yet within your grasp. Use only choice and refusal, but use even these lightly, with reservation, and without straining. The best view comes after the hardest climb. Experience is the teacher of all things. You are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. C.S. Lewis People don't get what they deserve. Being alone gives us an opportunity to reconnect with ourselves. You are one decision away from a completely different life. Alex Hormozzi all the positive emotion we feel. That's experienced in relationship to a goal. And so in some sense, you want a goal that you can never attain, right? So you can always move closer to the goal that recedes as you move towards it. You think, well, that's frustrating. It's like Sisyphus pushing the rock uphill. But it's not because as you pursue that goal, you put yourself together and your life does get better and richer and more abundant. We're running from the truth, man. So the only way I became successful was going towards the truth. As painful and as brutal as it is, it changed me. It, it allowed me to become, in my own right, who I am today. All the pain and suffering that they put on top of me in Hell Week, I will reverse that pain and suffering and I will take your soul. So every instructor that put me through buds, my job, what drove me, was I wanted you to go home that night after you beat the living shit out of me and I smiled in your face. I wanted you to feel worse than I did and you were going home to a nice warm bed with your wife or your kids and a nice meal and I was still out there in the grip. 
suffering for another 100 hours. I want you to think about me knowing that I'm comfortable being very uncomfortable. The thing about transformation is you have to do it. You've got to put in the work when nobody cares. You know, nobody cared if I practiced. Nobody cared if I worked out. I didn't have uh, parents who are like, hey, you know, Dan, you got to go to the gym. Oh, hey, Dan, you know, go out and run some sprints. Nobody cared. If you want to transform, you have to do the work if nobody cares. There's only one person who has to care. That's you. You've got to. The things themselves that affect us, they stand without doors, neither knowing anything themselves, nor able to utter anything unto others concerning themselves. What then is it that passeth verdict on them? The understanding. Do not give in too much to feelings. An overly sensitive heart is an unhappy possession on this shaky earth. Do not go broke trying to impress broke people. We must dare to be great, and we must realize that greatness is the fruit of toil and sacrifice and high courage. Theodore Roosevelt